Okay, uh, here I would like to mention about the rest of the uh, thesis. Basically, I'm going to propose three techniques. The first one is going to be tracking the uh, using the leveraging, sorry, using the Virtual devices for steering wheel and driver tracking. And then in the second part, I'm going to extend this uh, study to a single sensor approach, where we can, which we believe it can be used for the uh, head tracking. And in the third part, I'm going to uh, mention about the customizable paper interfaces that might uh, co cover the preventive techniques. Uh, for the steering, uh, for the uh, steering wheel tracking, there are certain safety applications. I want to mention them here because they are specific to this application. The first one is detecting under steering or oversteering. Uh, we can track the vehicle's movement by using the mobile phone and we can track the steering wheel um, if we can detect the steering wheel usage by using the wearable sensor then we can compare these two and we can uh, maybe we can detect the understeer or oversteer ones. For the curve speed warning uh, by utilizing by crowdsourcing the first data we can warn the other drivers about the dangerous curves etc. And by comparing the car's motion and the steering wheel angle, not only, only during the turns, but constantly, we could maybe find the alignment problems of the car and it could uh, detect the car maintenance. It can alert for the car maintenance. And by comparing the steering wheel angle usage with an online map, then maybe we can find the times where the driver actually changed lanes. Um, Apart from the existing solutions I mentioned, I will briefly mention about the uh, existing solutions specific to this work. Uh, there have been steering wheel based studies basically, but these studies um, use either the sensors placed in the uh, steering wheel or they actually externally place uh, sensors. But these studies rely on the steering wheel angle, which is not readily available for the mobile phones. That's what we are trying to find out by using the wearable devices. And for the actually activity tra tracking community has been using wearable devices for a long time for uh, smoking detection or jogging or act for other type of activities. But these are not specific to the driving scenario. And as, as I mentioned before, inertial data is uh, more complex in a moving vehicle. Uh, I would like to give an approach overview. Uh, the final goal we can say at this point is that we, find, we try to find the steering wheel turning angle, but before finding this, we actually need to know whether the user is driver or passenger. And after we know he is the driver, then we can find whether his hands, or, uh, hands are on the steering wheel or, or off the steering wheel. And by only we know that his hands are on the steering wheel, then we can estimate the steering wheel turn and angle by using a variable sensor. Uh, for the first part, we use the circular arm movements, which is simply, uh, in simple terms, if the driver is rotating his hand while uh, the vehicle is turning, we assume he is the driver. For the uh, hands-on off steering wheel tracking, we use linear arm movements. And finally, for the steering wheel turning angle, we utilize the wrist rotation that we obtain from the variable smartwatch. Um, our system, as I said, it, it takes the inertial data from smartwatch and um, mobile device, and it has a driver passenger classification module, which estimates whether the user is driver or passenger. Then we have hands-on off steering wheel detection module. It finds out the times where the user hands on the steering wheel. And finally, we have steering wheel angle estimation, where we find the steering wheel's angle. Uh, apart from these modules, we have a, a separate module, which is called coordinate alignment, which is shared across the other modules. And basically, we need to coordinate alignment because the data we collected from the sensors are actually in their own reference frame. And we need to align this accelerometer data or the other data into a, a common coordinate frame. That's why we use coordinate alignment. And in the coordinate frame uh, alignment, um, we use coterminants, which is something that we get from the Android API. Uh, and it's basically, they 
get the, they create this data, quaternions, from the accelerometer gyroscope or the megatometer. And we utilize this for two purposes. The first one is represent the rotation of the sensor with respect to another sensor, or to represent the vector defined or a measurement, like accelerometer measurement, defined in sensor frame to the world coordinate frame. Uh, here I would like to mention about the driver-passenger classification part. As I said, uh, the main idea in the driver-passenger classification is uh, we check whether the user rotates his hand while the car is making a turn. And if he is, then we assume he is the driver. Uh, for this purpose, we actually first need to know when the, a turn uh, event happens. That's why we ha have a turn detection. And in the beginning of the turn detection, we actually use the uh, smartphone's gyroscope data, which collects the car's movements. And this, by using the gyroscope data, we can find the vehicle turn. However, in our studies, we observed that the driver first starts to move his hand, then vehicle starts to turn. That's why we also need to collect data about the, his first hand movement. And for this purpose, we actually use the uh, smartwatch gyroscope uh, measurements. And after we find the turn uh, periods, we extract some features such as rotational change, hand acceleration, car acceleration, and first hand movement. I'm not going to mention about these features in detail, but you can find them in my thesis or the papers that I've published. Um, and then after we uh, extracted these features, we feed them into a support vector machine and for the driver passenger classification purposes. Uh, for the hand on steering wheel detection, we first need to detect, as I said, we first need to detect the linear hand movements of the user. So we first detect the hand movements of the user, then we estimate their linear direction, whether it's an up hand movement or down hand movement or uh, right hand movement or uh, left hand movement. Then we match them in pairs to find where the user's actually hand is on the steering wheel, which is simply a up, an up hand movement might be actually leaving the steering wheel or might be coming back to the steering wheel. The only way to understand it to find the previous down hand, hand movement or leading hand movement. Are these all done in the car reference frame? These are uh, actually, yes. Because the sensors work in the sort of absolute reference frame, right? Yes. Uh, actually, they work, yes, uh, in their or, or own coordinate frame. Right. And we use coordinate alignment. That, that's actually a really good question. Uh, for example, we get the wrist acceleration. Then we use our coordinate alignment module by the, using the rotation provided by the Android API. We eliminate car's movement by simply subtracting the uh, mobile phone's acceleration data. And then we find peaks on that data and cluster those because there might be multiple peaks around the same region. Uh, but if you're turning a corner, the reference frame of where the car, where the car reference frame is, is different, as you said, for between the inboard and the outboard side of the turn, right? Well, it is, yes, that's right. So you have a different acceleration as you go around a, a corner. The inside is going to have a different acceleration than the outside. That's true, but the thing is, uh, it is always taken for the car's coordinate frame, mm -hmm. it will be stable. It's not with respect to Earth's coordinate frame. For the Earth's coordinate frame, it will be rotated. I just wonder how you subtract it off, because it depends on whether the car is going straight or turning also. Um, at this point, it's actually, we would like to subtract all the car's movement because in the uh, variable device, we see the car's movement related movements and we also see the hand's movement related. So by rotating, by using the coordinate alignment, we get the uh, values in the car's coordinate frame. Okay. And then we estimate the direction of the hand movement. Um, we have two scenarios for this one. In general scenario, for example, for a uh, downhand movement, we see first an acceleration, then the acceleration. And for an up movement, we would like, we would expect to see the other way around. But uh, this is the general scenario. But we also observed for the uphand movement, uh, sometimes we miss the second peak. And we believe this might be due to the, uh, that we are not perfectly able to eliminate the gravity. 
So some of that component is still reflected on the data. That's why we define an additional rule for, uh, for finding the uh, estimation of the linear direction estimation. And as I said, after we find these up-hand movements and down-hand movements, we would like to actually match them so we can find where the user hand is, when the user hand is off the steering wheel or on the steering wheel. And for this one, we have uh, rotation angle based, magnitude based matching algorithm. And for example, for here, the 14th down hand movement could be matched either with the 13th or 15th, but based on their magnitude, we match them with the 14th, uh, 15th, sorry. The final part is the steering wheel angle estimation. For the steering wheel angle estimation, uh, we utilize the wrist rotation and then we use a profile to actually uh, find the steering wheel angle. Uh, how, do we how do we find the wrist rotation? It's, we again use the coordinate alignment and we remove the vehicle's angular velocity and then we simply integrate. And why do we need a profile? Uh, the main reason is although wrist rotation is related to the steering wheel angle, it's not directly proportional. It's not directly uh, linear proportion. So that's why we need a profile. And how do we create the profile? We use offline data and use the uh, linear regression algorithm. Okay, our experiment setup. Uh, in our experiment setups, we use in one sense uh, inertial sensors, 9-axis motion sensors running at 50 hertz. And one is on the wrist and the other one is placed on the steering wheel and that is only used for the ground truth purposes. And we also had a smartphone in the middle to track the vehicle's movements. Fine. And we had a GoPro camera to record the whole thing. And we tested this with two different car models, Honda Civic and Toyota Camry. And uh, our regulation has three bodies. The first one is the driver passenger classification. For this one, we collected several hours of drives with a total of 280 turns. And for the steering wheel angle regulation, we had 20 trips. Uh, highway and local roads. We choose the highways because they have smooth curves and local roads for sharp turns and large angles. And for the hand-on of evaluation, uh, we had another extra route where the user, where the driver was able to take his hands off the steering wheel uh, intentionally and safely. Uh, for the performance evaluation, I will first give the steering wheel angle estimation results. So, mean error of our results for almost uh, between 0 and 30 degrees and 30 to, 60 degree, 30 to 60 degrees and the angles more than 60 degrees, the mean error was almost close, almost zero. Um, but standard deviation was a critical factor here. For 0 to 30 degrees, it was 2.21. For 30 to 60 degrees, it was 3.82. And if it is larger than 60 degrees, it was 6.12. Uh, at this point, we can ask, what does actually this correspond to? What type of uh, safety application this can enable, or what type of accuracy that it will give? Um, we actually uh, it, uh, proved that for a minimum slip detect for a slip detection safety application, if the steering wheel angle is between zero and thirty degrees, our uh, method will be able to detect. We could detect the uh, sleeping, car slipping events which are larger than 10 degrees with an error rate of 1%. Mm. And if the steering wheel angle is between 30 to 60 degrees, our method will be able to detect the slipping angles more than 20 degrees with 0.5% error rate. And if it is larger than 60 degrees, we will be able to detect uh, slipping angles more than 20 degrees with 5% accuracy. I don't want to get into the details of this too much because it's mostly mathematically proven and I have provided the details in the paper and the thesis but it basically goes with the uh, false positives in the paper. Uh, I, I don't want the details but I'd be interested to know from a driver's point of view these angles, how do they correspond to real situations? You're driving along on snow and and you uh, oversteer, is 10 degrees a lot or a little? Well, I don't have a sense of that. That's actually really hard to say because, I mean, there's 
no real way that we can experiment these with, by drifting the car. So, but 10 but degrees... You've got some pretty big parking lots. <laughs> <laughs> I have some skill, but I don't, I'm not willing to risk my life for that. <laughs> so, yeah, but 10 degrees, I mean, you could assume a very slight turn. Mm -hmm. Or 20 degrees might be a little larger, but it will be still less than uh, 112. I mean, it will be less than 118th, right, of a full turn. Um, how many how many turns is a wheel in a modern car? Two and a half. Two and a half? I'm not sure about One and a half. One and a half. One and a half. Okay. So the ten degrees is is that's the fraction of a full lock to lock turn, which is ninety degrees roughly. It, it also depends your uh, speed yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. the wheel goes it's lock to lock from something like 45 degrees to 45 degrees. Uh, so it's about a 90 degree. That's something I. I was trying to get a sense of what the accuracy yeah. is in terms of percentage of your full range motion. Okay. But I mean, there's also I mean, for the full lock, it's probably it probably does not change. But based on the Ackerman ge geometry. Uh, from car to car, actually, uh, how much they rotate might change. It's not a linear matching as far as I know, but I'm not quite sure at this level. Uh, for the handoff steering wheel detection, our uh, system was able to achieve 99.9% .9 put through positive rate and 89.2% true negative rate. But it was in terms of the duration, and duration might be a little misleading. Uh, in this type of studies. That's why we also uh, evaluated in terms of the hands-on off events and our algorithm was in overall achieved 89% uh, true negative rate and uh, it got less than 10.5% false negative rate and we also tested different type of hand movements such as when the hand goes to leg or when it goes to armrest or it goes to sun visor we have seen that the, when the hand goes to some visor, the performance slightly, I mean, performance actually uh, drops to 81%. And we believe this might be still due to the, that we are not perfectly eliminating the gravity. That might be the case because it's going against the gravity. For turn detection part, actually for our limited data set, we did not find any false positives. And for the driver passenger classification, um, our total overall accuracy was around 98.9% uh, .9 accuracy. And we also tested for different uh, driver habits, and we saw that uh, when the driver is actually eating, the accuracy drops, and we believe this might be because the driver is actually making a lot of rotational hand movements, and the vehicle thinks, uh, I mean, when, and the approach thinks that he's rotating his hand. That was the first part, and at this point I actually decided to use the same techniques for the uh, head tracking approach. But it turned out to be, it wasn't a really good application, I mean, it wasn't really applicable to that case, and I will mention why it is the case. Uh, our motivation is the standard orientation tracking methods, such as Android API, which uses the uh, inertial sensors to uh, track the orientation, do not work very well in the vehicle. And when we pin down the problem, we found that the vehicle introduces additional magnetic noise to magnetometer data. And the magnetic noise is especially affecting the yaw angle estimation. For the roll angle, it's not that much effective, but for the yaw angle, basically, it is the North Pole's direction. And yaw angle is actually critical for the head tracking. And at this point, the question is, can we still estimate the orientation of head-mounted device in a moving vehicle? And the other thing is, uh, recently, standalone wearable apps are becoming more popular. The first generation Android uh, wearables were using the smartphone, but now they have the uh, uh, standalone apps too. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a challenge to separate the vehicle's motion from sensor's motion by using only a single inertial sensor. And the second question is, can we track the vehicle's and the sensor's orientation 
from a single variable sensor. So, and if we can enable this for the head tracking applications, uh, for the head tracking, uh, then we can probably uh, enable some uh, safety applications. For example, inattentive distracted driving detection. Uh, for example, in means of whether the driver checked the uh, sides at an intersection, or whether the uh, whether the driver actually keeps his eyes on the road. Um, also, we can provide aided driving applications by showing proper warnings to the user based on where he's looking at. And finally, by checking the user driver's responsiveness, we could maybe tell whether he's under influence or not. Uh, single sensor approach in a moving vehicle is actually uh, not explored by many researchers. Uh, apart from our multi-sensor approach, the most of the studies are based on the camera-based face orientation tracking, and they require the camera. But um, and they require they also use the computer vision techniques, which are computationally intensive, and we don't really want to use them. In our approach, though, uh, it requires only a single inertial sensor, and it mostly relies on the magnetometer data. I would like to give a very brief uh, idea of what we are getting inside the vehicle in terms of the magnetic field. Uh, basically, we are measuring the Earth's magnetic field plus the car's magnetic field in the vehicle, but we are only getting the sum of them. Uh, but by, by utilizing the magnitude of the measured magnetic field, we can find the angle between the Earth's magnetic field and the car's magnetic field, which is I denote here as an alpha. Uh, and by using this alpha angle we, and uh, pre-calculated uh, noise profile, we can estimate the vehicle's heading angle, and we can also estimate the sensor's orientation with respect to vehicle and Earth. Okay. Uh, I will have to give more background on the vehicle's magnetic noise. This is what we are getting when we get into the car and how the, the magnetic field actually changes, the, that magnetic noise changes uh, within the vehicle. So in the first part, we actually take the sensor and get the measurements outside of the car in an open field. So what we are getting is actually the, mostly the Earth's magnetic field. Then we take the sensor to the car's uh, floor while the engine is off and we see a change in the magnetometer readings although orientation of the sensor is the same with the outside. And then we turn the engine on and we haven't observed any change in the uh, actual measurements. And then we take the sensor to the seat while the engine is off and here you can see there's a, still a change in the data. So with the position it changed actually. Then we run the engine again, then we started to move with the vehicle, and we haven't seen any change in the uh, measurements. There are two takeout uh, lessons from here. The first one is because of the ferromagnetic materials in the car, uh, it creates a change in the magnetic field. And the second one is that the, this magnetic noise is actually po position dependent, but it is not affected by engine run or the speed. At least for our experiments, we haven't observed that. And since we are talking about the magnetic noise, there are two effects of the magnetic noise. The first one is the hard iron effect, and the other one is the soft iron effect. Hard iron effect acts as a separate magnetic field, and basically it is added to uh, magnetometer measurements. Uh, and the soft iron effect uh, changes the measurements by showing different magnitudes on different, uh, ang uh, on different axes of the sensor. So if you rotate the sensor, you should be, for the x-axis and y-axis, you should be getting the same angle when it's directed to the same, directed to the same uh, source. But uh, we haven't seen actually uh, significant soft iron effects uh, specific to the in-vehicle, uh, um, sorry, in-vehicle uh, noise. And here I would like to show two data uh, set we collected. The first one, the blue one, is outside of the vehicle and we rotate the sensor 360 degrees. These are the XYZ components of the magnetometer readings. And as you can see, we get a uh, circular shape. 
that means, and then when we take the, uh, the second one is when it is inside of the vehicle and the Earth's magnetic field is rotating uh, around the sensor. And here we also still see a, a circular shape. And that means if, it, if there was a soft iron effect, this would actually cause a more ellipsoid like shape. And you can see basically the, the first circle is uh, shifted. And this is due to the uh, hard iron effect, basically the edit magnetic field noise. Okay? And how does the magnetic field change during a turn? The first one is when the sensor rotates. When the sensor rotates, the magnetic field inside the vehicle actually does not change at all. But for the sensor, uh, it will be as if it is state, uh, stationary and the vector is rotating along itself. And the magnitude of the measurement will, be, will not be changing at all because the alpha angle between those uh, measurements won't be changing. And when the vehicle rotates, for the sensor, actually the magnetic field will be also rotating uh, with itself. And that's why it will be static for the sensor. And uh, for it, it will be only the Earth's magnetic field will be rotating. And we will still get a circle, but the uh, uh, center point will be slightly biased. And the sensor measurement will be actually changing with the angle between these. And here you can see actually you, we will get a, a cosine-like shape, which is not a uh, coincidence. It is actually comes from the uh, cosine law in vector addition. And when we take this into 3D, uh, for the first one, we will actually get uh, data points on a sphere. For the second part, we are going to get a circle on the base of a cone, where the apex is actually the uh, car's magnetic field, because it is the bias. And that cone is, uh, for us, important. Okay, go one more slide. Let me give a brief intro about, uh, for our system design. We use the uh, sensors, accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer data, and we have a vehicle magnetic field profiler. And by using this uh, profile and the vehicles, uh, the sensor data we get, we estimate this uh, vehicle setting angle. Then we use in vehicle sensor rotation uh, estimation to find the vehicle, uh, vehicle to find the sensors rotation with respect to car. And we also find the uh, sensor's rotation with respect to Earth. Let me first introduce the uh, vehicle magnetic field profiling. Basically, uh, for this part, it is, we can see it as a calibration. For, specific, for a specific point, we need to make a 360 degree car turn. And we use this data to profile uh, the magnetic noise inside the vehicle. And as I mentioned before, when the vehicle makes a 360 degree turn, we are getting a circle on the base of a cone. And this uh, part is actually getting the parameters of this turn. Here you can see the car's yaw angle denoted by y. And we have the alpha angle that we can calculate from the magnitude of the uh, magnetometer readings. And basically, we are, match we are using this uh, as a reference point. There's one thing I forgot to mention here. For the profiling stage, the sensor is actually fixed, and we assume this orient, we accept this orientation as the car's coordinate frame. Uh, vehicle for the vehicle heading estimation, uh, vehicle's heading yaw uh, is independent of sensor's orientation, and from as I said earlier. From the magnitude of the magnetometer readings, we can find the alpha angle, which is the angle between the car's magnetic field and the Earth's magnetic field. And by using this alpha angle and the profile parameters, we can actually find a uh, car's yaw angle. Here I showed small, uh, I mean, little equations, but this equation actually like three pages long, but it has actually, it has analytic geometry to find the alpha angle from the yaw angle. But I showed it. For, a, for one purpose, which is, here you can see a, we have an arc sine function, which is defined between 0 and pi degrees, but the car's angle is actually between one, uh, 0 and 2 pi. That's why we have two uh, potential candidates for the yaw angle. You have only the 
magnitude of the magnetic field? Yes. So there's more than one solution? Uh, for the vehicle setting, there is only one solution. Assume that we don't have a, a sensor that is... Oh, rotating. because you already know the magnitude uh, without the yeah. first field. Yeah. Okay. That makes it unique. Yeah. And by... We have two possible yaw angles. And they have different uh, signs. Basically, they have the opposite signs. Mm -hmm. Which means that while one is increasing, the other one will be decreasing. And we use this, we combine this with the gyroscope data. If the gyroscope based orientation increases, then we choose the one which increases. Uh, this basically explains that part. But the selection operation actually might cause fluctuations in the output data. That's why we also have a temporal filter that requires at least two consecutive samples to switch between the selections. Then after we find this uh, car's uh, heading angle, and by using the temporal, uh, by using the profile parameters, actually we can find the the ex uh, expected magnetic field uh, with respect to car's coordinate frame, which is shown as HD here with the asterisk, and we only need to find the rotation matrix that will actually uh, transform this into actual measurement. So we know that what it is supposed to be in terms of the car's magnetic field, and we know what the sensor is actually rotated. And by using that, we can actually find the rot uh, uh, reference, sorry, rotation between the, these two. And if we know the, this rotation matrix gives the uh, vehicle's orient sensor's orientation, and by using the sensor orientation with respect to car, and by combining it with the vehicle's or uh, heading, then we can estimate with respect to Earth. Finally, experiments. Uh, in, experiment, in our experiments, we use under Arduino-controlled stepper motor, which rotates with the 2.81 degree increments, and we place this setup vertically and horizontally for yaw and pitch angles. Uh, we use also 3D printing spinning wheel on a wooden plank and away from magnet ferromagnetic materials. That's that way, when the sensor rotates, it will, uh, the magnetic field will be changing. We tested with three drivers, two cars. One is Hyundai Tucson, the other one is Mercedes-Benz. Uh, we had a 360 degree uh, sensor turn in an open field for calibration purposes. And basically, it's a calibration check. We just wanted to be sure that our calibration matrix was uh, correct. And then we had a 360-degree deg uh, vehicle turn for the profiling purposes, as I mentioned before. For the heading angle, uh, vehicle heading angle estimation experiments, we tested the uh, angles uh, 0, 90, 180, and 270 degrees. And we tested, each angle at, uh, we tested each angle 10 times at different positions, locations. Um, and the ground truth was simply the perpendicular li lines on the parking lot. Uh, for the sensor orientation estimation, our Arduino board was rotating our sensor with 30 degree counterclockwise increments, and we obtained 480 degree, uh, 480 turns. And drivers were uh, free or controlled, made free or controlled drives. It was mixed. Uh, some of them are in the highway and I mean they usually start in the parking lot and they go to the highway. In terms of the performance evaluation, our heading estimation evaluation uh, had a mean error of 4.57 degrees with the standard deviation of 2.97 degrees and we believe that this might be actually improper placement of the car too because a slight shift in the car's uh, placement might cause a couple of degrees so it's not uh, the ground truth also might have some uh, error too. Uh, and we haven't observed any significant errors when the vehicle is fixed but the sensor, and the sensor rotates. We just saw small uh, fluctuations due to the yaw selection process I mentioned earlier. Finally, for the in-vehicle orientation estimation, uh, our yaw estimation had a mean error of 5.61 degree error and with a standard uh, deviation of 3.46. For the pitch angle estimation, it, it performed better 
and the mean error was 3.73 degrees um, and standard deviation was 1.51 degrees and this might be because uh, although we are eliminating the car's movement, car's orientation still yaw angle and the car's heading yaw angle are on the same axis and this might be cause, I mean, this might be the reason why the yaw angle is yaw angle estimation is uh, a little worse in terms of performance than pitch angle estimation and we also observed 8.89 degree ripples on average when the sensor is fixed and the uh, vehicle is making 360 degree turns. Just out of curiosity, I don't know what the specs are in modern cars, but when a car is pointing in a certain direction, it doesn't go that direction. That's the alignment of the, of the suspension. So is that a degree or a fraction of a degree or multiple degrees? The cars go down the road like this. Yeah. Right? Well, does every car, I mean, I don't know the well, it has to, right? specs it's of it. Because wheels, so it's going yeah. To, yeah. It's going to do something like this. The question is, what's that angle relative to the dimensions you measure? I believe it is supposed to be within certain angles. Right. Otherwise, the car needs an alignment. Exactly. So it's my question was, is that what is the one degree or a tenth of a degree? I have no I idea. I suspect it's more like a degree. It will probably be a degree. Another factory or another average or well, there's a spec for the suspension on a car that it has to be within a certain range so the tires don't wear badly. Right. They don't care if it's pointed the right way, but they well, don't want the tires to wear. I mean, based on my experience, basically, even when I have a, a car where the alignment is actually horrible, mm -hmm. it actually uh, swipes a couple of meters when I actually drive like 100 meters, right? Okay. So that may not be that big. Well, so that's, that's, a couple, that's two degrees. Two degrees? Well, a couple of meters versus a hundred meters is two percent. Two percent of a uh, well, hundred degrees is Our two degrees. Right? Yeah. Our tangent zero point zero two, I don't know. <laughs> it's it says roughly, yeah. minus plus one degree is, okay. is preferred. It's what? Minus plus one degree is preferred. It's a line. Okay. So it's a degree. So it's a degree. Okay. I'm just trying to put this into perspective here. Yeah. Then we compared our method with the um, uh, computer single sensor based uh, computer vision techniques and actually we have observed that our technique performs better than most of the computer -based, vision based studies. Only Shai et al. used dynamic templates and re-registration technique performed better than our uh, technique and uh, the, the, the thing is they only tested for a controlled room, they didn't actually did a in vehicle study, so we don't know the results for an in vehicle. And the computer vision techniques also, I mean, they estimate the head angle, but they don't give any idea about the car's heading angle. And we also compared this with our multi sensor approach that I mentioned in the previous uh, section. Um, we saw that our pitch angle estimation is almost as good as two sensor based approach, and yaw angle is, uh, was as I mentioned, more susceptible to vehicles movements, that's why there were more uh, errors. Limitations and future work. Uh, this, this actually applies to every compass when you go to the North Pole. If, this, if the Earth's magnetic field uh, aligned with the gravity, your compass wouldn't work. So that's one. Uh, the, that's why if the magnetic field and the gravity vectors are aligned, the magnetic field measurement you're getting actually loses its significance. The other part is closeness to ferromagnetic materials actually uh, cause problems and the, the approach is position dependent. So that's why we think this approach will be uh, best fit for the applications where the sensor's translation motion is limited, such as head tracking. For arm tracking, it will probably not work because your arm might get too close to the door and the, uh, the magnetic field is quite changed at that point. And for the limitations and future, uh, for the future work, maybe by introducing external ma controlled magnetic field in the vehicle, then we could get better results by maybe by modulating. And Maybe the, the cause, uh, maybe the position dependency can be used for actually 
positioning of the sensor within the vehicle, but that needs to be further studied. As a conclusion, uh, we propose one sensor to track the sensors and vehicle's motion, and we model the vehicle's magnetic field and sensor's magnetic field. Our uh, methods mean error was uh, 5.6 to 1 degree for yaw angle and 3.7 degree for pitch angle. This concludes this part. Uh, and the third and final part is actually for in terms of the preventive methods. We would like to uh, reduce the number of distractions that the driver has by, uh, by proposing a customizable input buttons, shortcut buttons that he can use to interact with the phone or any other device. And this is a work that I presented in Ubicom 2015. Our motivation is we are surrounded by ubiquitous devices and what if we could touch enable a much richer set of objects in our environment. Just like the 3D printing led to enormous creativity in creating objects, if we can simplify creating these interfaces, could people use it for safer interaction with mobile devices or maybe outside of the vehicle for other interaction purposes? Maybe they could use it, uh, they could stick it onto their steering wheel and they could, ins instead of navigating to home by using their smartphone, they could just press a button and they could have other functions too. There are a couple of challenges uh, for these interfaces. The first one is uh, they need to be customizable for different applications and they should be accommodating, accommodating a various number of touch points and they should be easily produced. They shouldn't require any hardware knowledge or even software knowledge and they should be local so they could be used by many people. There are existing solutions in that field too. Uh, the first set is the projection and camera based systems where the device actually keeps track of the fingers. And there had been audio sensing where they fingerprint the audio environment and there had been variable keywords, a uh, keyboard, sorry. But all these approaches actually requires careful setup. And if anything changed in the setup, it needs to be reset. And there have been conductive in play solutions, which our approach is also in this category. The first uh, research was in by resistive graphs. Uh, for this one, actually, they required multiple layers of printing, and that's why it was really, it was harder to uh, create these interfaces. The other one was PrintSense, which is very interesting. They actually not only detected the touch events, and they detected other type of uh, sensor data such as the proximity, etc. But they require a large number of GPIO lines, and every time you want to customize an interface, you need to come up with a different design. There had been circuit stickers. Um, this is easy to produce, but they require extra components on the paper and uh, for extra touch points. In our approach, uh, we have a sorry, we have a, a custom printable interface that the user can print, and we have an external readout device, and only necessary traces are actually printed on the paper, and it can be printed in a single layer. All the other components are on external readout device, and we introduce a resistive polarity switching technique, which uh, enables us to change the layout and the number of touch points without modifying the clip-like device and the interface. So you can just change the paper and you can use it for any design. Here's an example design process. Basically you go to a software and lay out your design in the way you wish and then you print it out from an inkjet printer by using commercially available conductive ink. Uh, then you can stick it into your car and basically this is controlled by an Arduino board and you can it is really easy to connect it with a if this and that type of app uh, and you don't need to actually write the software but I'm not going to get into the details of the software part in that part uh, in that section uh, let's move to our design goals from our challenges 
Uh, our first design goal is it needs to be single layer and it shouldn't require any mounting of circuit components. Uh, it should be accommodating multiple touch points and it should be easy to con uh, connect. In our approach, we have a, a paper interface that can be uh, printed on a uh, plain photograph paper which is flexible and very cheap and it can be printed in a single layer printing and all the external components are in a small external attachable device and it, does, uh, it has an interface to connect the device to the paper and that device and the interface doesn't have to be changed uh, based on your design. Let me give a brief idea about our paper circuit. Let's get into the details here. On top, we have a voltage divider circuit. Although uh, this is conductive ink, it has a higher resistant, uh, resistance than the copper trace. And by using this, uh, by exploiting this property, and we uh, create a snake-like shape, and we get actually a three, almost three kilo ohm resistance on this line. And, and now we, by using this voltage divider, we, can, we are able to get different voltage levels at each touch point. And when the finger touches, actually, it uh, conducts the two terminals, and we should be able to measure the uh, voltage at the sense line, which is the bottom line. But this is a very simplified version of it. Uh, if we know the finger resistance in this circuit, it will be really easy to find the uh, which key the user is pressing. But finger resistance actually depends on various factors and it varies a lot. Uh, for example, here, two different touch points pressed three times and we can, you can see we can get the, we get the similar level of voltage measurements. And that's why we need to measure the skin resistance, which is a very hard task because uh, So we need to measure the skin resistance, but it is hard because we are trying to print this in a single layer and we don't have any extra routing space. Uh, that's why we decided to use the same circuit. And we introduced polarity switching technique. Simply by changing the voltage that we apply to the voltage divider, uh, we get two different measurements. And when we carried out the equations, we see that, that ratio between those measurements are actually showing us where the key is, where the user pressed the key. Our algorithms, basically we first need to detect the touch event, and it's a threshold based algorithm, we just add the two measurements. And for the touch point recognition, we get the ratio of the voltage readings and estimate the touch point. And then there might be fluctuations in the data, that's why we have a temporal filter um, and there is one part I need to mention, which is the calibration stage. Uh, although the conductive ink is, uh, has resistive proper property, it, is, it doesn't have uniform resistance. So we don't know the voltage levels that we will get at the uh, design time. That's why we need to calibrate it. And the calibration step is only done once uh, before the, after the, printed, uh, the circuit is printed and dried out. Uh, there are a couple of assumptions we do here. The first one is we assume that finger X purely as a resistor, which is not true. There's actually a phenomenon called AC hum. Uh, basically, your body acts as an antenna, and you, you will intru be introducing voltage to the circuit, which will be at 6 hertz. Uh, that's why we take multiple samples in a cycle of AC noise and average these samples, and it acts as a filter. Um, the uh, second one is we assume that the paper is non-conductive but the resistance between the uh, paper terminals actually is 500 mega ohms and when you have 25 of them it drops to 20 mega ohms because they're in parallel and this is which is close to skin resistivity so what we suggest at this point is as we increase the number of touch points we should increase the gap between the terminals we tested for a couple of key factors such as finger resistance, key patterns and their size and number of keys and key press frequency. Uh, we tested in regular office environment. Uh, we have observed misdetection errors, false detection errors and multiple detection errors. 
Uh, for the number of keys, we tested for 1, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 keys. And we saw that as the number of the uh, keys increase, the false detection and multiple detection uh, errors increase with the number of keys. And we tested different patterns, as I show here, and uh, two different sizes. We saw that the best performance obtained for the rectangular pattern, uh, shown here. And for the different sizes, actually, we haven't seen any difference. We also uh, tried different pattern widths and heights and gap height. Uh, we, didn't see, we observed the pattern width and the height is not an important factor, but the gap height is an important factor. As we increase the gap height, actually, after a certain point, um, the finger starts to not to press the buttons fully, and that's decreasing the performance. Others, we tested the typing speed and we were able to press up to 154 key presses per minute with a 10 key keypad. Uh, we tested for the skin resistance and our system works accurately up to 50 mega ohm. Um, above 50 mega ohm, simply uh, it doesn't work because the voltage drop across the finger becomes too significant. And Actually, not many people have the skin resistance more than 50 mega ohms. I have observed only one person out of 26 people I have tested, which was a girl. Uh, women usually have higher skin resistance because they have small fingers. Point. So it's sad for she won't be able to use it. There are certain <laughs> there are certain limitations. Uh, this doesn't support multi-touch, and uh, if the body is grounded. Basically, the voltage you're going to measure is going to be zero, it, and it won't work. And uh, finger resistance, if the finger resistance is higher than 50 mega ohms, it doesn't work. And the ink also has um, issues. Uh, it, it is a chipping, and the paper is also cheap. It can come off after a certain time of usage. In conclusion, uh, the, we proposed a method that eliminates the need for assembly or wire connections to large number of conductive tracks on the paper. We propose the polar switch resistive touch identification technique that supports multiple touch points with only three connections. And finally, we believe that the, this framework could enable drivers to create customizable printable paper button interfaces to create shortcuts and reduce mobile uh, device related distractions. And apart from these three studies, I actually uh, had been involved in other studies too. Uh, the first one was uh, basically in terms of the managing the interactions, it was, for example, giving uh, an opportunity to the user to text while at a uh, red light. And I also filed a patent application at General Motors and this was about uh, audio browsing uh, by using a smartphone in the vehicle and it was context aware system so you could interact with the other drivers too. So these are the input and output mechanisms that I, that I suggest for the um, preventive techniques. Finally, for the thesis conclusion, uh, I propose this, uh, our system is composed of three uh, parts. The first part is use of risk and variable devices to track fine grained driving behaviors such as steering wheel and usage and angle. Our system was able to achieve 98.9% .9 driver detection accuracy in experiments. And we had handoff steering wheel detection uh, with true positive rate around 99% and true negative rate more than 80%. Uh, steering wheel angle estimation error was less than 3.4 degrees. In the second part, we extended our work to cover the head tracking applications and by using only single sensor. Uh, and in our studies, uh, single sensor to find the vehicle heading and sensor orientation. Our mean error for the yaw angle of the sensor was 5.61 degrees and uh, 3.73 degrees for pitch angle. Uh, and we believe this is especially suitable for head tracking applications where the translational motion is limited. Finally, uh, we propose a customizable printable paper interface to reduce the mobile device usage related distractions and our accuracy was about 99% up to 10 touch points and about 90% with 15 touch points. And these are the list of the publications that I have published during the, my PhD education.
and I would like to take this opportunity to thank people, especially my advisor Marco Gurtasar. He was such a role model for me, and I, I mean, he changed my PhD education completely. Mohammed knows this best, I guess. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, dissertation committee too uh, for their suggestions and their help all these years. Uh, and I would like to thank the advisors, uh, advisors of Guardian Angels, uh, Professor Ying Ying Chan, Yan Wen, uh, and Richard Martin. I would like to also thank Professor Richard Howard, not only because of uh, being uh, in my committee, but also always being here when I need his knowledge. Uh, I also want to thank my co-authors, especially Lu Yang Liu, Hong Yu Li, and also my friends from my previous lab, Pearl Padini and Harib. Uh, also my friends here, Mohammed, Bin, Viet, Gurkam, Shubham, who are not here anymore, Ines and Musab, Ali and Dragoslav. And finally I would like to thank the, uh, sorry, not finally, uh, Vinla family and EC department I would like to thank. Um, finally, my family and friends, Kenneth Lipman, Gusha Channel, my girlfriend, Zeynep and Orhan Kardash, my sister and my uh, dad, and my uh, mom, Aitan Yurgus. And I would like to dedicate this work to Mustafa Kemal Atatürk and Oktay Sinanoğlu. Thank you.